firstly, congratulations on Cometh the Storm. Um, it is absolutely just monstrous from the very first notes. Um, how, what would, the, Thanks, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges in creating it? The biggest challenges in creating the album? Well, well... <laughs> Come on, I, I mean, can't the band's be the definitely... first journal to ask that I got, I, I got one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. These guys live in Portland. I live in LA. So uh, we kind of had to figure out different ways to meet in the middle to uh, <laughs> to get all these songs written and stuff. But So sometimes Jeff would come down or Matt and Jeff would come down to where I live and uh, right down there and I have to come up here. So that was, you know, we didn't have the luxury of uh, always being at the same town and being able to just like pop down to the, the practice space uh every day or every other day or anything like that so we kind of had to uh do some of the writing remotely and uh you know firm up all the arrangements and stuff and we could all get together at the same time yeah, definitely you know we, there was some file exchanging for sure but you know this is the kind of band that it really things really start happening when the three of us get together in the same room yeah cody i feel like you could take this experience as the biggest endorsement ever as you as a drummer because like if they if they wanted to make life easy they could have just found a drummer in portland i know right uh, yeah it's uh uh pretty flattering that uh, they would think of me and and go through all this inconvenience just to have me on board so it's well, awesome you, yeah you know during the the you know after des left the group you know we we played with a couple of different drummers before we we got cody in the mix and uh you know they both did did great jobs um you know filling in and playing with us but you know i've said it before i'll say it again cody was at the top of my list of you know my wish list of of prospective drummers nice. so i was you know we we were thrilled when uh you know i called him up on the phone asked him if he was into jamming and you know he said yes so yeah we're we're really happy to have him it was a surprise <laughs> i wasn't <laughs> i was not expecting that phone call i had i had other plans but uh i was i was stoked uh i've known these guys for a really long time and and uh i've been a fan of the band for a really long time so the idea of getting to play some of these songs and and play with these guys was very exciting there's matt hey. <laughs> Yeah, I feel I terrible. Do. I don't know how long, because I've been looking at you guys, I don't know how long Matt's been sitting there because it's been, you've been in my waiting room. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and sorry, I, I got a bathroom break, man, so we're cool. <laughs> I'm all about that. I'm all about that. Um, so, guys, uh, a bloke in my neighbourhood, uh, a few doors down from me, has a Matt Pike for President bumper sticker, which I see every day. If you... Oh. Uh, which I'm assuming is you, Matt. Uh, if you were elected tomorrow, what would you? What would your first order of business be? Uh, <laughs> oh God! Uh, I'd fire everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. It's uh, a good answer. Yeah, I, I wouldn't drain the swamp. I'd take my El Camino out of it. <laughs> oh. You know, I, I don't know. I, I'm thinking of smart ass shit that's not clever. I, I that's a hard Honestly, question. Buy yeah. everyone and hire them back on like seventy thousand dollars a year. You want to start making, uh, you know, financial yeah. decisions for people? No, put yeah, I put term limits on shit, and yeah, pay it like every the rest of us, and now you have a normal job. You know, mm -hmm. except you get to make exciting decisions for everyone, so don't fuck around. Yeah, you know? <laughs> something like that. So uh, my first exposure to High on Fire was I randomly got given the uh, Sounds of the Underground DVD, for which I believe was in like 2006, and there was a performance of you guys performing uh, what is still to this day my favourite High on Fire song, uh, Hung, Drawn and Quartered. And I was it exposed me to a whole new kind of genre of music because I was like, what, what the fuck? What's, what's stoner metal? What is this? <laughs> this shit's amazing. Um and it, it got me thinking, there's so many different kinds of heaviness. Like, you could have one person saying that a band like Strapping Young Lad is the heaviest band ever. You could have uh, another band saying that Chelsea. Black Sabbath are. And you'd both be right. What does the term mean to you guys? Uh, heaviness? 
yeah, I don't know. One self-expression through loud amps and distortion and cooperation with with your peers. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess like... Uh, you know, some things that could characterize it or um, just, you know, a sense of weight behind what's being played. Um, emotional content. Um, you know, uh, discordance. Um, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of elements to it. Yeah, emotional content, like a finger pointing to the moon. <laughs> don't concentrate <laughs> on the finger, or you'll miss all that heavenly glory. <laughs> heavenly glory. <laughs> it, our, Bruce Lee. <laughs> oh, I, Bruce Lee. Much, I, uh, <laughs> uh, I think it was an art rock band called Ox, and we were, we were talking about that very subject, and I said that it doesn't matter if you are doing, you know, the world's fastest shredding or just playing a single note as loud and as, as singularly as possible. All you are trying to do at the end of the day is make all the blokes heads in the front row go like this. Yeah. And that's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's okay. a, then you what? know, <laughs> sorry. Go, no, go back. Go. No, then it's, a, then it's like a valid understanding. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you're rarely having people in the crowd. No, no, no. Shit, mm -mm. I like it. <laughs> 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 you guys worked with uh, one of my favorite artists, Kurt Ballou, uh, as a producer. How would you guys just what What's he like to work with? How would you describe him as a producer? Uh, yes, well, he's like our fourth member. I mean, like when we go in there, he's a, he's not only amazing at the engineering part, but he's really creative and he has some really good, he has really good insight to our band in particular. Um, he, he knows how we should sound and what we kind of go for, you know, he understands it. So it makes him particularly good for us to work with for, you know, my part of things, if anybody wants to elaborate. Yeah. I mean, he, he you know, he's been doing it with us for so long now. Um, you know, it's, uh, he definitely does feel like another member of the band when it comes to, uh, to recording, you know, he definitely, definitely, you know, understands us like as people and players and he understands the aesthetic of the band and, you know, just kind of what we go for sonically. And, you know, he, he brings out the best in us, you know, both sound wise and performance wise. What do you, yeah, it, what? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I, I was, 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 was just going to say, it was my first time working with him, uh, and I thought he was great. He really, I got the sense that he did really know this band inside and out, um, and he knew his studio really well, and he, like, squeezed every last drop he could out of his studio to, to do all this stuff. He's always thinking about new ways to get where he wants to go in the studio, and it was uh, it was cool to to see what he had going on there. And he, he did a really great job on this record. I thought he really, he put the hours in and he put the effort in and he used all his skills. So it was, it was cool to watch. But one thing that, uh, Matt, one thing theme that's, that's come up with in interviews I've seen for, you know, high on fire, particularly, uh, sleep is marijuana. Um, uh, and uh, I wondered, what did the, the widespread legalization, well, the legalization of, of weed in most parts of the U.S., what did that kind of mean for you personally? Well, um, when I lived on the, uh, uh, the dope farm, I probably wouldn't have been happy because that means you're losing money because the government's taking it from you. Um, and, you, you, you know, burying it in the ground, you don't make nearly as much. But at the same time, I chose music over that. I had an opportunity in my life where I could have gone that route and I'd still be in the hills. Um, but I, I think it always should have been. I, I think for a lot of people, it's medicine. And I think that, you know, there's it's nonsense that alcohol and tobacco are legal and marijuana is not, you know, let alone, you know, I, I like mushrooms or, you know, like things that, you know, it ain't going to kill you and it doesn't make you violent. I, I, I can't remember the last time marijuana made me violent. You know, like, mm. or, or, or uh, you get what I'm saying as a, yeah, yeah. It's just, I don't know. 
I thought it was cool. Now, Matt, we, we all know that's not true. I once watched the documentary Reefer Madness, and I believe a man ki uh, kills someone with a golf club in that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that good weed. <laughs> that, that, that's the weed called KJ. It has, like, PCP in it and shit. Yeah. I smoked that with the Cholos when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> turns the room brown, and you give all your cigarettes away. And like, yeah. <laughs> uh one track that has really stuck out for me uh on the new album hit now i'm gonna murder this pronunciation karan lick yol i believe um yeah. what it's absolutely mesmerizing what inspired it that track is um it's it's a direct product of uh my study of Turkish folk music. Yeah, I've been really into that type of music for a number of years now. And uh, yeah, back in like around 2019, I started studying it pretty seriously, uh, learning how to play the Turkish traditional lute, the balama, um, studying with a few different teachers over in Turkey, um, both, you know, started out online and then I've I've visited Istanbul a couple of times and studied face to face uh, with some folks. Um, but yeah, that song is kind of, uh, you know, the, you know, it's sort of my attempt at writing like a Turkish folk dance or something like that. Like a, a piece of Anatolian folk music, but high on fire eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, um, yeah, I, I found myself wanting to smoke a hookah. I don't know why. Maybe it was just the <laughs> the shisha, the shisha. Yes. <laughs> I love shisha. That stuff's awesome. <laughs> what plans do you guys have? When was the last time you guys were in Australia? It's, it's been, been a while. while. I want to say like twenty sixteen, maybe. Well, that's unacceptable, guys. When are you coming back? <laughs> I, I know. Well, you hey, man. <laughs> But bug some promoters, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm We're sure ready. we'll get there. Yeah, just got to figure that out. We don't have the same, you know. COVID did a number on the music world, so uh, yeah, it's a matter of finding the right contacts and the right bookers and all sorts of stuff, you know. But uh, we're doing interviews for Australia, so obviously we're, you know, there's that narrative. Yeah, I'll start. I'll start bugging. I'll, I'll start bugging my promoter friends down here. Let's make it happen. Well, how have you, would you, what impression did Australia leave on you the last time you were here? I don't know. I've always loved it there. I, I, I love going to Australia. Um, it left a great impression. I mean, we were doing good then, uh, you know, in most of the towns and stuff. And even if they're small gigs, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah, we've always had great shows in Australia. You know, the audiences are generally really enthusiastic and, you know, just a, yeah, it's just always a lot of fun whenever we come down there. One of my favorite questions I like to ask people is their formative gigs. Now, what I mean by that is like, what was the, the shows that you saw when you were very young growing up or whatever that, completely blew your mind like for example uh henry rollins has said that uh he went to see the ramones when he was a kid with ian mckay and all these other people and he said everyone in that car went on to form a band because of that <laughs> that gig what what do you guys have a, a gig like that, that springs to mind i went I uh oh god got you no no i was I mean, uh, Go ahead, go you. It's, <laughs> it's, I, I feel like I'll, a Portland stop sign around here. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll make it quick. I, I I went and saw. I went to a bunch of different shows when I was a kid uh, in Seattle. I, I grew up north of Seattle, so like when that was like the whole grunge thing was going on, uh, I I couldn't believe it was happening so close to where I lived. So there's this club called the OK Hotel, and I would always like. Uh, drive down there as soon as I was able to drive and go to see all these shows, these all ages shows that were there. But um, it was right, right in like I think it was like a freshman in high school or a sophomore in high school. 
when uh, I got a cassette of Nirvana Bleach, and shortly thereafter, I went with a friend to see uh, uh, it was the Breeders, the Melvins, and Nirvana uh, on the In Utero tour, and, and that was the first time live I saw Dale Kroeber play drums, and that was a uh, uh, that was a, a kind of a mind blowing moment for me, where uh, the way he did it and his style. We were talking about heavy and like the quality of heaviness, and just uh, I, I'd seen so many drummers that try to play fast or try to play hard, but he's the first guy I saw that just used space where it was every time he hit the drums, it felt like he was hitting them at the last possible moment that it was possible to hit the drums. And it just made you like wait and it just made you hang. So, and I was like, that's it. Like that's, that kind of changed how I thought about everything that, that day. <laughs> and I, I knew what I wanted to do that day. So that was, that was the show where I was like, Nirvana was fine. They were good. But uh, uh, seeing the Melvins that that night, I was like, "This is this is something else." And I, I it kind of set me down a different path. I just saw them for the first time ever this year, uh, opening for Mister Bungle, and oh. I damn near gave myself. Then you just saw me play. Was that you with them uh, yeah. in Brisbane? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah right. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I couldn't remember if Dale Crover was. Um, it was. Oh, dude. It was absolutely stunning, and uh, I swear, was Honey Bucket played like twice as fast, or is it always? Yeah, just that? that's my fault. That's my fault. <laughs> no, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, that one is a challenge with Buzz because he always like he refuses to be like because I'll, I'll talk to him. I'll be like, I think we're playing that song pretty fast, man. Like I think it, it's going pretty. But he he's like, no, it's fine. It's fine. He like won't. He'll start it fast, and then I'm like, it's this weird game of chicken where I. He's like, are you going to slow it down? And he's like, I can play it fast. I can play it. So it's like, we're, it's it, it just gets faster and faster and stupid. But no, it's great. We uh, the Brisbane show is great. That was that was fun. We we had a really good tour there. It was a, it was really fun, and uh, the weather was great. The food was great, and the crowds were great. Hatton fucked with me. But I I I, ha- I wasn't familiar with what where Bungle set was going to go. So when they started playing uh, Hell Awaits. And of course, you know, oh, you know yeah. like, oh my God, Dave LeBar, holy fuck. Yeah, 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 yeah. We start going absolutely mental, the intro, and it builds and builds. And we're like, oh, this is fucking amazing. All right, time for the first verse. And no. Nope. Is- <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's. That's cruelty almost. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Twitch. That's the old Twitch. That's the old Twitch. I was just flipping off and going like, fuck you, dude. <laughs> one, one, one might get the idea that he's almost masochistic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or sadistic. Or oh, both. Dear. Some sort of combination of sadism, sadism and masochism. <laughs> Jeff and Matt, what, what about you guys? What are some formative gigs that, that spring to mind? Oh, definitely the Melvins at Gilman Street. Now that you brought up the Melvins uh, and uh, Neurosis, like like oh, a yeah. lot of I, I I got to move to the Bay and I got kind of spoiled like with the scene there after I'd been in Denver. The show and two shows in Denver, I saw uh, Slayer Rain and Blood when they came through um, at this place called Norman's that was like out in the sticks and. Uh, uh, dude, that was just absolutely that that changed my outlook on music. And then I got to see David Gilmore's Pink Floyd, and it was like I took a bunch of acid and I was a kid. And I mean, it was like I was real young. I was probably like 13 or 14, and I just it just destroyed my brain. And I saw Iron Maiden at Red Rocks. Um, and the first time I got to see Motorhead. You know, I, I've I've seen all these bands, so I but those were the ones that stood out. You know, as far as like what I can remember, I, I'm sure there's a lot more. Like I saw Creator and Voivod at 1987. I saw uh, the Circle Jerks and Corrosion and Conformity before. You know, like when they were like they like Eye for an Eye and, and Animosity. Like that's all that was out. So. There, there's certain things, man, and there's lots more than that, but I'm just not thinking of them. <laughs> Jeff, what do you reckon? So many. Oh, geez. Um, I think the show that really, um, the first show that like truly really kicked my ass was seeing uh, 
ministry play in Seattle on the Psalm 69 tour. And uh, I, it was so fucking loud and intense and just like total sensory assault. Um, <laughs> I had just gotten that album and I was just like, I couldn't believe how, how fucking intense it, it was and how good they were. And uh, I remember at that show, um, uh, some of the guys from Soundgarden came out and they did Super Knot. And I was just like losing my mind. It was so, it was so <laughs> fucking good. Um, but yeah, that was like, that was the first show that I went to that just totally like, you know, I, I went into the pit and just totally got <laughs> mashed to shit. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I think I lost my glasses that night. And uh, yeah, it was, it was amazing. But yeah, that was <laughs> one of the more memorable ones from my youth. I feel like it's only concerts where you can say, oh, man, I went there. I got the shit beaten out of me. I lost my phone. I lost my glasses. It was amazing. Uh, 10, 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I definitely had my nose broke at a Slayer concert. I did. That was in Oakland, though. Oh, and, God. And once it's again, I was on LSD, and it was this gigantic Anunnaki guy. I was like a skinny little skater kid. And this guy's hand was probably as big as my head, and I just remember going, ooh. And my nose being like sideways on my face, and I like pop, it like popped back in. I was like, oh, and I, I had to like, I got through the show, but in my no I had black eyes, and I just sneezed blood all over everyone, and like, you know, it was like crazy. <laughs> I love it. Uh, just to finish up, what are, as guys who have had a lot of experience being on the road, what are some of your tips for surviving the rigors of touring? Socks, clean socks are everything. Yes. I'm serious. <laughs> it, it, yeah. Sometimes a clean pair of socks is equivalent to uh, eight hours of sleep. <laughs> like after you've been <laughs> stewing in your own juices for a while, like, I like a human being again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Um, a bag of holding. Uh, I used to, I still will do that, but I, I don't drink anymore. But a uh, crown royal bag to put your wallet, your keys, everything you can lose and your money in one place so that when you you're in the van and you take everything off or you're in your hotel room, have a bag of holding. It, it doesn't have to be a crown Royal one, but I just remember for years I had the same one and I never lost anything as long as I had that thing. Yeah. I like it. Um, what are you my, my advice would be to make sure you know where your passport is at all times. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. a good one. That's a good one. Ah, oh, God, I'm so glad I was never a tour manager. I feel great sympathy for, like, the poor bastard who had to tour manage Pantera back in the day. Like, uh, Can you imagine trying to get those four people on the same bus? You know? Oh, <laughs> oh for God's God. sake. <laughs> oh, probably aged in 20 years. God, <laughs> this has been fantastic. Thank you very much for your time. Um, congratulations on the new album. And, yeah, I... Really hope to see you in Australia soon. Thanks a lot, Thanks, man. man. We Thanks hope to be there. Much Tom. Yeah. Easy. Hope to see you soon. All uh, right. Have a good one, guys. Yeah. See, ya. Right. see you. Tom. Take care. The next one. Right. Bye. See you.